let's learn today how to call some genes. And what I've done is um, provided you a document with every single step you need to do in order to determine the start of a gene. Now calling a gene involves determining one, if you really think it is a gene, two, what is the most reasonable start call for the gene, and of course determining the function. And today we're just going to do the first two steps. Is the predicted gene in DNA master really a gene? And where is the start? So what you are going to need in order to call genes is you need your DNA master program installed properly. It needs to be updated and have the preferences set in DNA master. You're going to need an audit, auto annotation of your genome. So a DNA master file um, that preferably has BLAST data. This is kind of tricky to get, so we are going to provide you with an auto annotation of, the, of your assigned genome with the BLAST data. Um, to carry out gene calling, you should have already read the annotation guide, and you should also watch the um, associated videos, including this one. Before you watch this video, you should watch the 24-minute super boring Malloy video on the guiding principles of genome annotation. This will really help you understand the rules that I'm using to make decisions about gene calls. You should have your pecan account open to the phage genome that you're looking at. In this case, I'll be looking at uh, the genome, Greg, and I have that open in pecan right here. And you should also have a coding potential output for your phase genome. And I've indicated the two types of coding potential that you will need for each of your genomes. Now, pecan has coding potential um, that's trained on the host bacterium's uh, codon usage uh, attached to the, uh, the phage page. And um, you just need to click on this button and it'll open it for you. And I've provided that for you. But you should also have open a copy of the gene mark S coding potential for each of the genomes. Um, for now, I'm just going to go back and forth looking at um, the coding potential in, um, based on M. smegmatis. But know that I'm including data from gene mark S as well in all my notes. Okay. So, where do we begin? Well, first of all, I have a procedure for what I'm doing, and I've called the first three genes in the Greg genome, and I've provided you with example um, notebook entries for each of those gene calls. I am only going to go over GP2 in this video, and it turned out that actually all three of those genes were a little bit tricky, <laughs> so they weren't the perfect examples to show you. Um, for example, GP1, I called and decided that it wasn't a gene, so it would be good for you to look at my notebook entry for GP1 and look at the logic that I use to uh, not include this gene in the final genome annotation. We are going to be going over um, GP3. So here is my procedure, and I've pasted that into this document. I also have this in my notebook entry. And um, it includes the instructions for de determining function. I'm not going to be going over how to determine a function in this video. We will be doing that in the following week. Um, and I've recorded my notes in both the pecan program, um, and I'm going to show you how to do that. But I'm also recording more detailed notes in my electronic notebook. And there's a sample of my electronic notebook at the bottom of this document. And it includes. Um, screenshots of all the evidence I need in order to support the gene calls that I'm making and then I'll have all that evidence present when I want to present the gene call to my peers in class. So we're going to begin with DNA master and we're going to first try to determine if GP3 is a gene and if it is identify the most reasonable start for GP3. So I'm going to go to my DNA master window we're not going to do updates right now um, and I'm going to click on GP3 in the Features tab, and that takes me to uh, the description page where I can see that the start is at 749, the stop is at 1057. I can look in the Notes page, and it should tell me whether Glimmer or GeneMark or both programs called the 749 start. 
Here it says original glimmer call at base pair 749. Um, because gene mark isn't mentioned, that means that gene mark agreed with this call. If gene mark is mentioned, then we know that it actually called or predicted a different start. So the next thing I want to do is open up frames for the Greg genome. And here's frames. I'm going to slide it down here so I can see both the features tab and the frames at the same time. I'm going to push the ORF button down here so I can see where all the genes were predicted. And zoom in and scroll to the area of the genome where I'm beginning my annotation. And so now I can see genes 1, 2, and 3. And um, I'll give you a heads up. Here's the gene that I decided wasn't real. Here's GP2. And we're going to call GP3. You can see that it has one, two, three, four possible starts. Here is the stop for GP3. You can see that the start here, I'm going to be, the glimmer and gene mark seem to have chosen the start with the longest possible ORF. And that start looks like it might be overlapping with the stop of GP2. So I'm using this visual to predict what I'm probably going to see when I move over to Pecan. So now what I want to do is uh, move to the page that has the gene I'm interested in. So I'm going to scroll down to GP3, which is showing me uh, the start and the stop. And the easiest thing to do is match the stop with the stop, because the stop will always be the same, but it's possible that in Pecan, a different start was chosen in this program. So I'm going to click on this, and it will take me to the, the phase page. And what it's showing me is that Glimmer and, and Gene Mark both have chosen 749 as a start. And so what I've done down here in my notes is indicate that 749 is a start that was favored by both Glimmer and Gene Mark. And I typed that into the notes section. And so that is consistent with what we saw in DNA Master. Um, and I've shown you over here how to enter that part of the notes once you've determined that. The next thing that you're going to determine is, is it the longest, does this start create the longest ORF or the second longest ORF? And looking at all the starts listed here, I can see that 749 creates the longest possible ORF. We knew that from looking at frames over here as well. And so I also indicate that in my notes. Then we're going to look to see what the overlap or gap is that's uh, created by the 749 start. And in class the other day, we tried to figure that out by looking um, at DNA Master. If this is a 749 start, we go to the gene before it and look to see where the stop is at 752. And we calculate the number of bases shared in genes 2 and 3 in order to calculate the overlap. Pecan makes this really easy. There's a column for each start that tells you what the gap is. If it's a negative number, that means it's an overlap. If it's a positive number, then that means it's a gap. So we know that four base pair overgaps are ideal. And so this is already showing me that this is probably the correct start. These starts back here uh, create really, really large gaps, which is not ideal. You can look over here and see that the selected gene is already checked here. If I wanted to change a start, what I could do is click on a different start, and it would say change selection to gene with start position 872, and I'd say OK. Um, and then I would come up here and save that. Um, however, now I've just saved an incorrect start, so I'm going to go back and change it to the original glimmer call. Um, because I think that's going to be the correct start. But that's how you would change the start if you didn't agree with the Glimmer and Gene Mark start. Okay, what's next? Um, we've typed in our notes here that uh, the 600 start is Glimmer and Gene Mark favored. It's the longest ORF. And now we've added in that it has a four base pair overlap. The next thing that we want to do is determine, does the 749 start include all the coding potential? And we also want to make sure that this gene has coding potential. So I'm going to click on the host trained gene mark, and I'm just going to check on the, 
the gene mark M smeg, but I want you guys to also check gene mark S. So I'm going to scroll along here and I'm going to find um, the stop, which is 1057. So these are all forward genes on the top three frames. And if I were looking for a reverse gene, I would look in these bottom three frames. So here is uh, 10, about 1049, 1057 rather. And this right here is the first start, which is the 749 start. Um, it's a little bit confusing because there's an ORF that comes right up next to it that you can see the stop right here. That's not part of the GP3 ORF. Okay, the next stop, uh, start rather, is all the way up here. And um, this is right in the middle of the coding potential. So it looks like the 749 start is the only start that includes all the coding potential. So I have indicated that the start includes all the coding potential in gene mark SMEG, and I also earlier checked gene mark S, and uh, the same was true there, and so I've indicated that in the notes. Um, I've taken screenshots and given a little description of both of these from gene mark S and from gene mark M SMEG. Okay, next what I want to do is look at the BLAST data for the gene. So one of the best ways to determine whether or not you really have a gene, we've seen that it has coding potential, but can we find sequence identity with known genes in the phages DB database and in NCBI? Um, and the other thing that is useful to look for, not only are there homologs, but is the 749 start conserved in those homologs? Because that's another rule about genes, is that true starts are usually found in all the homologs. And usually this rule works best if you're looking at homologs within the same cluster. Sometimes it's true outside the cluster, but sometimes it's not. So when you're looking at BLAST data, you want to be comparing it to genes um, from phage genomes that are within the same cluster. So where can we find the BLAST data? Well, we can find it in our DNA master file. And unfortunately, this Greg file doesn't have the BLAST data, so I'm going to quickly um, open the file for Sansa and show you how you can do that. So if we were looking at a gene in Sansa, and I'm just going to click on GP4, you would click on the BLAST tab. And whatever GP4 is for Sansa, it looks like it only matches one particular protein. And this is um, looking for matches in the NCBI database. So we can learn more about the match with this protein by looking at the data down here. We can see that it doesn't line up very well with whatever this protein is. The query is our protein, and it doesn't begin to align with the target protein that was in the database, which is whatever this hypothetical protein is. Um, and to this, the 73rd amino acid of the Sansa protein aligns with the 438th amino acid of the target. So that doesn't sound like a very good alignment. There's another piece of data here that tells us uh, the E value. That's the probability that th this was a random match. So a zero probability that this was a random match would indicate that we have a really good match. Um, this is a 0 0.84, which is not a good E value. It's very high. If we look at the alignment, we can see that there aren't very many amino acids that are actually matching up, and we can also see that the first amino acid of Sansa certainly does not align with the first amino acid of this hypothetical protein. So this would be a really bad blast match. Now if we looked at some of these other proteins, let's go to, I'm randomly clicking on them until I find one that looks good. Let's go back to five. If we look at GP5 of Sansa, um, this one aligns with uh, a whole bunch of proteins in the database, and they all look like they're major capsid proteins. Um, and it looks like um, we're looking at this first one. Um, it aligns Q1S1, so the first amino acids al align. We can see now that the E value is zero, which indicates that the, this wasn't some random match. And we can see that the query matches Q1S1 with the, with the targets. 
So that's a really good indication that this is a gene. And then whatever start this is um, for Sansa GP5, it's, it's a, probably the correct start according to the BLAST data. Okay, the other place we can look at BLAST data is in pecan. And so now we're talking again about GP3 from Greg. I'm gonna scroll down below the start information in pecan and there's two types of BLAST data here. We can look at the phases DB BLAST data. So this is the amino acid sequence of GP3 blasted against the entire phases DB database. And this is telling us which proteins uh, Greg3 matches best. And it matches um, a protein in a genome called Pippin, which is actually a humane genome and it matches itself which makes a lot of sense and it matches another humane um, genome called phaseal and you can see that these all have E values of zero so this indicates that this very likely is a gene now one of the things you have to pay attention to is these are all draft genomes we want to look um, for matches with non-draft genomes so if you look down here NeuroJ, Mr. Gordo, et cetera, so forth. These actually have function calls. So this is our first indication of a possible function for this protein. And it also has E values um, of, of zero, indicating that they are true matches. So I would indicate this in my notes, um, which I'm gonna come back to my paper over here, um, and show that I've jotted down that this um, protein Q1S1 matches up first amino acid, um, Q1S1, with a whole bunch of matches in um, both the phases DB database, um, but also in the NCBI database. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. Um, I've recorded the E value saying that these are real matches and how the first amino acid of uh, Greg3 matches with with those target proteins. So let's scroll down here and actually see how I know that it's Q1S1. This is the results of the NCBI BLAST data. Um, this gives me a little bit more information. It tells me that it matches Mycobacterium phage Wheeler. It doesn't tell me what gene number, um, but it does tell me that it matches, here's the query amino acid, matches the subject or target um, proteins first amino acid and it also tells me that the E value is zero for um, and that's true for all of these proteins including Jasper, uh, Bethlehem, and Pepe. So this information has been recorded in um, my notes in Pecan. So another way to check um, the conservation of a start is to check uh, the starter rate or data for Greg3. Now, um, the starter rate of data uh, for Greg3 is a little bit wonky. And actually, um, for all the A genomes, the starter rate data is going to be tricky because there are so many homologs um, in all those cluster A genomes. But we'll take a look, and I'll show you guys how to navigate that. And then I'm also going to show you an easier um, gene to analyze starter rate of data for, and that's for GP2. Um, so what you do is you scroll to the top of your page and you click on the starter rater number. And that gives you a report. Each one of these lines shows a track for a homolog, and there's many, many homologs. This is actually really not very informative looking at these particular tracks um, for two reasons, because um, there's so many tracks and also there's such disparity in the length of these homologs that they can't show it all on the same page. So we actually can't see the starts. But if we wanted to figure out what track was what, we'd come down here and what I do is use the find function to find Greg. And I already have that typed into find and I push enter. And it tells me that Greg with all these other phases is part of track two. I'd scroll up here um, and look for track two up here. Unfortunately, this isn't telling me anything because um, the starts are much further downstream um, and it's not showing in the report. But what I can find out from this report by scrolling down be beneath all the assignments, the track assignments, um, it's going to tell me what the most annotated start is for this homolog. The start number 
called the most often in the published annotations is start number 32 right here. So the question is, is 749 start of Greg what, what 32 is for all these other genes? So what I can do is click down until I find the report for all the Greg starts, okay? And it's telling us that the candidate start for Greg 2 is in fact start 749, and this is the same as start 32 for all these homologs. So 749 is the most annotated start for Greg. Let me show you a different gene that's a little bit easier to, to, to um, analyze. Let's go to start 2. This has very few homologs. If I click on the starter rater report for number 2, look, there's only five tracks here. And in fact, if you look at, let's look at track 5, we can see that there's one, two, three possible starts for these homologs. Um, we can also see that there's only two starts, number two and number three, that's conserved in all three, um, in all five of these homologs. And so this really green thick line indicates the start that was actually called in all of these phase genomes. The thick green one indicates what was called. So just looking at this data right alone, I would guess that start number two um, is the most annotated start, clearly, and it's, um, it's conserved in all homologs. So that's a good start, that this, that's a good sign that this is probably the correct start. Now I can come down here and see which track belongs to Greg. I still can't find it, so I'm gonna use the find feature. Find. Next one, here it is. So it's in track one, um, and it only has two and three. So somebody calling um, Ridge CB phage down here, if they called track uh, uh, start number one in their genome as, as the start, they would probably be incorrect since the start doesn't exist in any of the homologs, and we know that starts are typically conserved in all homologs. Um, you can go down further and see all the starts for Greg. Here it is, here's Greg, and it has two starts at 600 and 732, and so this most annotated start, number two, is, um, is actually the, the coordinates for that would be 600 in the Greg genome. Okay, so I have indicated this also in my notes that, um, that the most annotated start, um, that this start is the most annotated start, 749. There's one other thing that I just skipped over that we need to talk about, and that's Shine Del Garno sequences. We spent a lot of time last semester talking about Shine Del, Gar Shine Del Garno sequences, and uh, I'm going to go go back to, to three here. Um, here's our 749 start. Here's the four base pair overlap. Within this d table is also the final scores um, for the Shine Del Garno or ribosome binding site. Um, what this does is it's a score that indicates how good the consensus sequence is for the Shine Del Garno sequence and um, its location relative to the start codon. And you guys know that a really good Shine Del Garno sequence looks like AGG, AGG, and it's four to nine base pairs upstream of the start. So this score indicates how close it is to that criteria. So looking here, I can see that the best Shine Del, Shine Del Garno sequence, which is the highest number, and they're all gonna be negative numbers, so this is the highest number at negative 4.185, this right here is the best Shine Del Garno sequence for the start at 962. Now, we think that this start at 749 is the best start because it has a four base pair overlap, it's the longest ORF, it's the only start to include all the coding potential. Um, it doesn't have the best Shine Del Garno sequence, but it has a pretty good score at minus 4.2. So this is probably the least important piece of data, and I really only use it to break a tie when all the other data doesn't indicate one start or the other. Nevertheless, I'm going to include um, that information um, in my notes uh, in Pecan. If you scroll down here, you can see where the notes section is in Pecan, and I have a section on all 
the start in start data that I used to make the decision. And below that, you will also, once you learn how to call functions, record all the data that you used to call a function. Now, since um, I used some of this data to call the start, I'm going to actually click the box. Um, I was interested in this NeuroJ protein that it matched in, in, in BLAST-P. And if I scroll down, I was also interested in some of these proteins that it matched um, in uh, NCBI. If I push save, then all of that information is recorded in the annotation, not only my notes, but I've indicated what data I used to make my decisions. So um, take a look at the Greg genome, take a look at this document and go through each of the steps for calling a gene. If you scroll down, you can also see a notebook entry that I made for calling genes one through three, including um, the gene that I decided to delete in the Greg genome. And this should get you off to a really good start in calling your first genes in your genomes.